football, it was a clarity for me because it wasn't about the other guy. It was always about me. It was always about you need to do what you need to do. You know you're – and it's great because I always believed in my heart that I was better than the guy I was going against. If I did my job, that other guy didn't have a chance. This is Entrepreneurs the Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is the playbook. It's Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing with Entrepreneur the Playbook. And I am here with a tremendous man, not just in size, but in stature. One of my favorite people, Jonathan Ogden, 11 time Pro Bowler, Super Bowl champion, UCLA Bruin, uh, just an extraordinary human being. I'm gonna start there, Jonathan, because most people think, you know, born 6'9. Mm -hmm. three, you were playing, what, 350 pounds or Give so? Give or take. Give or take, oh, depending on what you have for dinner. You know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, oh, of course, everyone that big should make the NFL. And I remember Brad Pitt, because uh, it was interesting, he was on Dave Letterman, and Dave Letterman said something, well, you know, you're so good looking, of course you're successful. He goes, you know how many good looking people there are in the world? I'm an actor. Like, I'm a really good actor. That's why I'm successful. Right. T tell me about your playbook of, you know, the expectations are high when you're that big. Right. But not everyone big can play football, let alone in college and the NFL. Tell me what it took to, to make it to the NFL. Well, you know, it just kind of took a commitment to maximizing who and what I could be. You know, it was it's one thing to be big and strong, like you said, but to actually go to the weight room, lift the weights, to actually go run, to watch what you eat, and to be committed to trying to maximize what you have takes a lot of effort. And uh, that was always my thing. You know, I was always the guy who never wanted to feel like I left anything out there and on the football field, in the weight room, anywhere in preparation. And I always felt that if I did that, I'd be cheating myself and everybody by not maximizing my full potential. So that was always the way I approached everything. Well, I'm glad I didn't play against you in high school. <laughs> I know another ball. I mean, it wasn't quite as intense <laughs> in right. high school. But that's where it started to develop was right sure. around those days, yes. But uh, I know Sean Merriman, right, lights out, knocked mm -hmm. four guys out of a Baltimore high school game. I'm like, thank God I didn't play against him. But, I, you know, 5'7", 140-pound corner. So let me take you back to high school for a second. When when you're, you know, pulling you – know, you played offensive line. Mm -hmm. and, yep. So you're, you're pulling down the line, and there you see a guy that looks like me. About your size, yeah. Yeah. Did you lay up? Did you let up a little bit, or did you just bury him? Nah, I just try to run them over. Really? I just God. try to lay. I mean, look, and, if you're on the football field, yeah, I, mean, I, I might different. help you up, but <laughs> you, you know, I'd be like, "Ooh, you might not want to get in my way next time." Yeah. So, but that's when you know guys small that they are avoiding you. They're not. They're not. Well, I've to had plenty away. of people over the years, me and that I played in Baltimore and it's close to DC, who said they played against me in high school and said, "You know what? You made me realize that." Football was not for me. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of the way it was. That's the person in my life that is uh, made me realize. I played in college, but my first game freshman year, I was the bullet on the kickoff team, and uh, I was flying down playing in Zusa Pacific, and Christian Okoya ran me over, <laughs> size thirteen. The next year, he was the AFC Player of the Year. Right, it was his senior year, my freshman. And I always say that was the day I realized my NFL dream died. <laughs> Everybody has that moment <laughs> yeah. where they realize that. They had reached their pinnacle of football. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Well, you know, moving forward, let's talk about expectations. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're in high school really big. Now you go to UCLA, and expectations, you know, now they get real. Like right. The people, I'm sure when you were a freshman, they have high expectations at UCLA, and they're already talking about when you make the NFL. Tell me about how you dealt with those expectations, because anything can happen. You know, it's funny. Like, football in high school is fun. You know, it's really all about fun, and someone gives you a chance to get a scholarship. Like, hey, maybe I'll go to college for free. You know, then you get to college. So the first year, no matter what the expectations were, my only expectations were to go in there, try to do well in school, try to figure out what it meant to be a collegiate football player and try to figure it out and just keep moving on. I mean, I wasn't really thinking four years down the line. I was focused on the here and now. And, you know, I knew that the percentages were against people going to the NFL. And so try to get your education. And then as it progressed, that's when the pressure started to build. But then I became a better player, and things just kind of naturally progressed there. Now, when you, you came from Baltimore, D.C. area, mm -hmm. out to UCLA, totally different environment. Yes. Probably loved it. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Laughing at your friends back east. <laughs> but now, you know, I did a lot at UCLA back then. You know, you had Norton Jr. and Karras and Hennis and all the guys that I know. Mm -hmm. Do you guys all live in the northern suites? Is that where you lived, or were you out? 
We were up in the Hitch Saxon areas. I was up in Saxon for a couple of years. Then I and we were during the moped era where all the guys were driving those little mopeds. Yeah, a few guys had mopeds. I they, did not. I, I safety was <laughs> oh good. I was, I was gonna say because I remember Ken Norton Jr. had this tiny little moped and he was way too, I'm way too cautious a guy. You know, I'm like that measure three times, cut once, not just twice. I mean, nice. I'm the same way when I don't want to be on a moped. I almost I tried one once upon a time at a Pro Bowl in Hawaii. And I will never do it again. <laughs> uh, I started wobbling on the middle of a Waikiki, and I was like, oh, no. T- yeah. Took the moped right back. Now, that's awesome. I'm going to ask you a question that a lot of people don't know. The difference between a pro bowler and an all pro. Mm-hmm. Some of the players don't even know the difference. Can you explain kind of the audience of what that difference well, is? Well, basically, I mean, all pro is just you are the top five you, linemen, you know, that they pick that year. And pro bowlers are AFC, NFC. You got – you could be the fifth You best. got eight, <laughs> you know, guys, eight linemen. So there's 16 pro bowlers. There are five all pro guys. So Right. So, you know, yeah. And, and today it's especially, I think, relevant because when you played in the Pro Bowl, guys wanted to play. Yes. The, the money actually made a little bit of a difference because mm-hmm. you got paid. But you actually played hard. And it was in Hawaii. And it was in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. And it was a family thing. And, exactly. You know, I went all the – that's where we, I think we met. Exactly. But, you know, today you literally could be like – Almost a second string guy because nobody goes. I mean, it's like the fifteenth, sixteenth quarterback sometimes makes yeah. it. I mean, you know, you don't really have to. It's don't get me wrong; it's a tremendous honor, but it yeah. is not as much. Being at the Pro Bowl, the the way they move the time and everything, so Super Bowl people are automatically excluded. So it's just not the same. Not the same at all. And the, and being a All Pro though, that means you're the best. At yes, position. exactly. So so people that don't know football as well, it's important that they see that because I have a seven year old son, like you have a twelve year old son. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they get confused. I say, oh, hold on. Just because, you know, so-and-so is making the Pro Bowl, let's look at the all-pro guys. Right. This is who exactly. you want to look up to. Exactly. Um, now, so you graduate UCLA, and you get to play at home. Mm-hmm. Now, talk about the pressure. You know, I was offered a job one time as the chief executive of the Padres, and I grew up in San Diego. And I was at Lee Steinberg. Okay. And I was too worried. I was like, this is a horrible job. One, I'm not talented enough to make the Padres win. And I was worried about all my friends, neighbors, family blaming me or calling me every time we lost. Were you concerned at all about that side of it? Not really. I mean, the good thing about Baltimore is that my family is based in D.C., so it was about an hour drive away, far enough that they couldn't just pop over for, hey, how you doing, but close enough that they could participate in all the games and everything. And again, nobody put more pressure on me than me. To succeed so any external pressures friends family it didn't really concern me it was all about getting it done being the best football player i could be at that time now were you one of those guys that got really nervous since you put a lot of pressure on yourself did you get really nervous before every game no you did so you weren't throwing up before the games no. but so tell me about that pressure though because you know a lot of times it creates resistance in our lives we you know, for, for mm-hmm. me, for example, I, I try too hard sometimes when yeah. I play baseball, and I think if well, I just got out of my own way, how'd that work for you? You know what? I, I don't, I don't, I can't really explain it. I'm fortunate enough that in football, when I felt more pressure, it's, it made me relax and become a better player. I know what you're saying because in golf, when, right. I, when I feel the pressure, <laughs> I, I, I tense up so it doesn't work that way. But in football, it was a clarity for me. It, because it wasn't about the other guy. It was always about me. It was always about you need to do what you need to do. You know you're – and it's great because I always believed in my heart that I was better than the guy I was going against. If I did my job, that other guy didn't have a chance. So when you think that, you yeah. know, all you got to do is just get yourself together. Right. Now, football's a team sport, and, you know, the unsung heroes are the offensive linemen. I still don't understand today – I'm a football guy – right? why you're spending your money, in my opinion, on some of these other positions – when I would spend the most money, I'd have a quarterback for sure. Yeah. But my offensive line, because you can make an average running back, no offense to Jamal or whoever, <laughs> but you know, you can make an average running back great if you're running behind Jonathan Ogden and others like you. It helps. I mean, the, the key has been the salary cap era, trying to get five guys who can work well together and you know, got to stay healthy because you only, no matter how good your best guy is, you're kind of only as strong as your weakest link, so you kind of have to – focus on everybody but you are correct I mean it is the engine of the Ferrari if you want to call a team that I mean offensive defensive line whoever wins that battle they win the game 90 plus percent of the time plus turnover so I would always focus up front now as an unsung hero right the the offensive lineman most people know your only time that people see you is when you make a mistake Mm -hmm. right when you're turning around and your your quarterback's uh flat 
face the way it goes. Yeah, like, yeah, know. <laughs> but tell me about your most exposed highlight, right? As an offensive lineman, your great career, all those years. Tell me about like, did you score a touchdown? Did t- tell me what you did. I mean, I'd probably say <laughs> I did score two touchdowns. I uh, against Pittsburgh my rookie year. Benny Testaverde threw me one in the end zone. We won that game, one of the four games we won that year. And Kyle Bowler threw me one in St. Louis. But my personal favorite thing is we were playing in, I think, my second or third Pro Bowl. No one, there's probably no tape of it. But <laughs> It's in black and white. No, <laughs> <laughs> but we were on the 10-yard line going in, and I forget who the quarterback was, through an interception of Deion Sanders in the end zone. And he starts to run the ball back the other way, and I sprint 80 yards as fast as I can and actually get a hand on Deion 80 yards down the field on the other side, slow him up enough for Ed McCaffrey to make a tackle to say, stop him from scoring, to going for halftime. That for me, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I snatched up Deion Sanders. I mean, they, <laughs> you know that? Yeah, that is awesome. That was so much fun. And uh, all the <laughs> you other stuff. to tell people he was high legged. Oh, well, like, yes. He was, 50, yeah, he, right? You know what? He might have had to do some bobbing and weaving and yeah, avoiding yeah. a few yeah. people. I had a great angle. But the story as the years have progressed is like he had a start. I snatched him up. That's all. Awesome. I'll, I'll live with that story. And no surprise, McCaffrey's with you, right? Because he's well known for never giving up. That's right. That's right. And I, I love that about him. That play. That's right, man. Ways. I mean, it was one of those things in my mind. I was like, I have no chance to catch Deion Sanders, but I said, I have to try. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> I have to moment. try. I, I love. You that. don't get those chances very often. Absolutely. Now you also played individual sports. In fact. I heard the reason you went to UCLA mm-hmm. was because they were allow you to do track, and they yep. had one of the world's best yep. college track teams, mm-hmm. and still do. Yep. I think more Olympians. Most people don't know this about UCLA. There's more Olympian medalists at UCLA than most countries. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean UCLA is just as far as overall sports. I think we have the most NCAA championships of all, and I mean John Wooden. Yes, I mean <laughs> I mean well exactly, and I mean just the whole environment about. As much as I love football, I was about you know, school and everything. I didn't choose UCLA just because I thought we had the best chance to win the national championship. I went there because I thought I could become the best well-rounded person there. And part of that for me, coming out of high school, was throwing a shot, putting discus. And uh, fortunately, I was good enough football that all the schools said I could do it. But, you know, it was just a great opportunity. We won a national championship there. I won the indoor NCAA championship throwing and some great friends. And it kept me out of spring football. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, it kept f- football fresh in my mind too. So whenever I came back to football in the in the uh, fall, we were I was always ready to go and ready to just knock some people around. Yeah, that's awesome. Now you also like another individual sport w- where you do get kind of the shine on good and bad, which is golf. Yes, and uh, it's the ultimate <laughs> nemesis. I'm, I'm sure. Yes. T- tell me about why you love golf so much. You know. It's just one of those games. I mean, it's hard to explain. You know, people either get the bug or they don't. I just think it's the fact that it's all on me. You know, having played a team sport for a song, even track and field is a team sport. You throw individual, but you compete as a team. You know, golf, it's just like (laughs) me and that little ball, and it doesn't move. It laughs at me. (laughs) You know, and it gets in my head, and I'm a basket case. You know, my wife says she's a golf widow, but (laughs) I I think it's really just the challenge of something that everything I've done athletically, I've been really good at just – whether it was basketball, track and field, football, just picking it up naturally good. Golf wasn't that way, and it frustrated me, and I wanted to be better. And that's the thing, though. I mean, as I started out when I was playing, I was maybe at best an 18 handicap. I couldn't cheat to break 100. Right. Now, you know, I'm a solid five handicap, you know, still not happy with it. But, you know, we just keep getting better. We keep working at it. And one day, maybe I'll be a scratch, but that's we'll awesome. just keep going. And where's your favorite course? You play? I know you play everywhere. Play everywhere. I'd probably say Bandon, Oregon. Yeah. Uh, the... Bandon Dunes, Pacific Dunes, those are just a fantastic property up there. And now, have you been back to the Masters? I have not. Really? Now, I'm giving you the on air right now. You have the ultimate invitation. You know, uh, I've gone 17 years in a row. Oh my goodness! We go with our company. We have great time. Badges. We have a home out to find the extra long bed. <laughs> but you are invited right here. All right. Uh, there's some great appearance stuff for Wheels Up and some other companies we work with. Um, well, it's, it is the best trip, John. I tell people all the time. I said, there's very few things you, you reckon like the Rose Bowl. Yes. You can recommend and I can get people, you know, since I'm on the board, tickets to the Rose Bowl. But if it's a bad game and they flew all the way out from Oklahoma. Right. And, and you know, it's awful. The only place that never disappoints me, Super Bowl, Pro Bowl, Masters, yeah. only the Masters, 
every year, the minute I walk in, this it's the coolest place I've ever been. I'm, you're sold. Sold. I'm there. And, <laughs> I mean, I tell you And if, yeah. if we're really lucky, some September, we always have the opportunity to get guys out there oh. of your stature to play. I've got to play once. Oh, and, how uh, was that? It, it, I mean, I, I will tell you, it was it was difficult, but Cyprus, you probably played now, Cyprus. That's another one. That's on. there, there are three courses that I haven't been invited to two of them. I just haven't had the chance, but Cyprus – um, Pine Valley, yeah, and uh, Augusta. And Pine Valley, m- most people don't know, is the, the most difficult course to get on in America. Then Cypress, then Augusta. Yes, yeah, so and those are the three that and you pretty much just drop anything if they. Come I'm a calling. 15 handicap, and I've got to play. I played with Lee Elder. Oh, he's and such a nice he man. likes to play with me because I'm one of the because I'm so much younger than he is, <laughs> but he can outdrive me still. So he goes, I like to play with Dave because I can outdrive somebody when I'm playing. There and, you go. <laughs> and that gave me my in to play Augusta in Cyprus. Now I've never played Pine Valley yet, but I have an in there I as do well. Too, so yes, you you like we got to exercise that. We got to get it going. Uh, you, there's no one I'd rather take uh-huh. and put it on your calendar first Let's week in it. April. Uh, we have a lot of guys you know out there. As you know, and, and they all play. They play while they're at the Masters, but not in Augusta. September is the time to play. So that sounds like a good time. All right, last question for you. What legacy? Oh, wait, one, first one question. Mm-hmm. Your, your son is 12. Yes. I have a seven-year-old son, and this is something that I'm going through. I love football. I played football till I couldn't play anymore, which was 22 years old. But if you could choose any sport for your son to be a professional in, what would it be? Golf. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Isn't it the best? I mean, so you're 70. You can you play, can play. I mean, I played with Kenny Perry, who's 57, I think, and he hit the ball past me. Yeah. And he's still making a million plus dollars, and he's loving his life because he's hitting a little golf ball around. Uh, in the most beautiful places in the world. And you can just you, get invited always to nice play weather. golf <laughs> wherever. They, you're America's guest as a PGA golfer. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time Phil Mickelson paid for a round of golf, I wonder? Right. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't paid to play, right? Exactly. The only time he plays is because he gambles afterwards. Exactly. I've gone to the farms with him, and he, he was a pretty good poker player. Oh, man. So That would be the sport right there. Yeah. Now, golf is not as easy when you're tall. Yeah. That tall. Very true. And so have you met any guys that were taller than you that were better golfers? I have not. Yeah, I haven't either. I, I, I haven't. <laughs> I've met some pretty tall guys who try to play, but none of them. And, you know, Dr. I think. Dr. J? Is no, he close? No, no, Doc's not. I, He's I, like a nine, I, right? I, yeah, I yeah. can beat Doc. Yeah. And then you throw in, if you want to throw in that, well, I used to say over like three 340, but now let's say over 300. If you that, you throw in the yeah. height and weight, I'm by far the best. Yeah, I, I'll have, take you out. Howard Wright, who played center for Stanford, I think he's around the same as you, so okay. that'd be a fun match to have you out there. And he goes a good 300, 6'9". So, okay. well, the basketball football challenge. I've been trying there. to get the old ex-offensive lineman out to play golf. I can't seem it's, to get yeah, no. out. I can't imagine why. It's easy to get the running backs, right? I know. Pitchers, the, the, the pitchers. QBs, I can get the quarterbacks to play golf. Yeah, I can get Kyle pitch- Bowler to play all day long. Now, these pitchers are getting taller. Yes. So, as you get older, you're going to have some 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, Josh ten. Johnson, who used to pitch for, I forget which team, but he's a member at my club in Las Vegas, and we've played, and he hits the ball a ton. Yeah, they're awesome. It's well, amazing. Guys, I mean, compared to how much you had to work, yes. pitchers work like every five they days. They work once every And they get to play golf Oh, everywhere. I threw the ball 80 times today. My arm's sore. Right, yeah, <laughs> compared to you. All right, last question. Yes. I know I've been delayed. What legacy do you want to leave? When it's all said and done, what legacy does Jonathan Ogden want to leave? I don't know. I mean, I uh, just want to be known as a guy who really just kind of Try to give back, try to maximize his skills professionally and try to just be the best person he could for his family and others and just try to be an overall decent human being to others. I mean, nothing so profound and deep, but just, you know, well, you're doing be, be, a, be a good guy. And you are. And I know your foundation does a lot of great work. If you yeah. want to, Quickly, I want to plug for your foundation. Yeah, so. I've been doing work in Baltimore for over 20 years now with uh, a couple high schools and we do uh, tutoring programs, we do life skill programs, trying to get kids in the inner city an opportunity to better their lives. We've done scholarships, you know, we've just done a lot of good things just to help these kids out. So it's all about the kids, really. That's awesome. Well, you are a great guy, and uh, I'm so glad that I've met you and, and we're friends. But, you know, the legacy you're leaving already is incredible. I really look forward to more good times. I know 
you know, one thing that comes across from your playbook is just because you have talent and skills, the things, and I, I tell myself that, you know, it's, I meet a lot of short guys like myself. Like, oh, if I was only six foot one, I would have been in the NFL. And I was, and knowing what I know, I'm like, you know how many guys are six feet one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I will tell you, I'm one of the few guys that are five, seven. I weigh more than 140 pounds now that knows that even if I was six one, I probably wouldn't have made it to the NFL after watching the guys that are in the NFL. You'd have got closer, but you know what? Exactly. I've li- I I won't trade my life. There I know you, go. you won't trade yours. Well, this is Dave Meltzer with All Pro and Pro Bowler and Super Bowl champion Jonathan Ogden here with Entrepreneurs the Playbook. And teams wanted you to pitch though. When yes. You were drafted. Yes. And you didn't want to pitch. No. And then ironically, but, you ended I up think with a shoulder injury. pitching is not fun. You just you don't pitch one enough, day right? and then five five days, four days, you don't do anything. So I choose for playing every day. That's awesome.